Welcome to this video manual for the Aeroplane Heaven Spitfire Mark 1A. Today we will be showing you all the features and functions of your new Spitfire, where everything is and how everything works. The Spitfire Mark 1A is a simple aeroplane, but does have quite a few systems which require careful study and practice if you are to operate the aeroplane correctly and realistically. We'll begin with the exterior. Spitfires are tail draggers. That is, they have a three-point stance with a tailwheel. This type of airframe is notorious for handling issues on the ground, when taxiing and taking off especially. So the first major feature we should look at is the fully castering tailwheel. This kind of tailwheel works rather like the wheels you'll find on a shopping trolley and has no connection with the rudder and cannot be steered. The Spitfire employs differential braking to turn, so a castering tailwheel is essential. Up front we can remove the engine covers using the click spot in the cockpit to reveal the fully modelled Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. This will also open the service hatches on the fuselage. A radio hatch is positioned just behind the cockpit and contains the TR9 communications radio. This radio is pre-tuned by ground crew before departure and can be operated via Bowden cables and a control unit mounted on the cockpit sidewall ahead of the door. On the right side of the fuselage at the rear is another hatch. This is the battery access hatch and contains the ship's battery. This battery is not used for starting and is charged via the engine's generator when it's running. The wings carry radiators. A large one on the starboard wing is the coolant radiator and has a door at the rear which is opened by a lever in the cockpit to increase airflow when on the ground. The port wing carries the oil radiator. The Mark 1A has a later bubble-style Perspex canopy, which afforded good all-round vision and better headroom for the pilot. A Spitfire Mark 1A could be fitted with a variety of propellers, ranging from wooden or metal two-speed units to the metal constant speed variable pitch unit fitted to our Spitfire. Manufactured by either de Havilland or Rotol, during the Battle of Britain, whatever propeller was actually fitted to the Spitfire was very much a question of what was available at the time. By the time of the Mark 1A, Spitfires were being fitted with armoured windscreens, armour behind the pilot, and de-icing equipment for the windscreen and canopy. You will notice we have left the parachute and harness ready on the wing for the ground crew to assist the pilot to strap in. Climb aboard and we'll take a look in the cockpit. The cockpit of a Spitfire is quite snug with everything to hand for the pilot. The canopy is opened by using the latch pull at the top of the windscreen frame. The cockpit door has two positions. The first is the canopy lock position in this position, the door will prevent the canopy from sliding forward, a safety measure when flying with the canopy open, or in the event of a ground accident, allowing easy egg egress by the pilot. The canopy lock position is achieved by clicking on the forward lock spring and then clicking the main handle will open the door fully. The harness resting in the seat pan indicates that the pilot is not aboard. Using the harness release switch, the harness disappears and the pilot will take his rightful place in the cockpit and the parachute has now disappeared from the wing. Our pilot wears the 1938 Mark III pattern goggles and oxygen mask, a somewhat cumbersome arrangement designed when RAF frontline fighters were open cockpit biplanes. It is correct for pilots flying in the Battle of Britain. Back in the cockpit, 
we'll take a tour of the instrument panel and instruments. Starting on the left at the top, we have the navigation light switch and the big metal switch which operates the pneumatically operated flaps. Flaps on a Spitfire are either up or down. There is no intermediate position. Below these two is the oxygen panel. The left dial sets the delivery rate and the right dial shows the contents of the oxygen tank. The centre butterfly knob sets the delivery rate. Oxygen supply is turned on using the control down on the right side of the pilot seat and turning this knob not only allows the oxygen panel to function but also toggles on the pilot's oxygen mask. Below the oxygen panel we have the chronometer on the left and the landing gear warning lights unit which carries a pull-down blind to lessen the glare from the lights at night. Further below on the left are the engine magnetos, the brake pressure indicator and the elevator trim indicator gauge. At the base of the left side panel are the controls and switches for the landing lights. The lights are carried in pods, one in each wing. These pods are extended and retracted with the control in the cockpit. The switch is identical to that for the flaps and when used it lowers the pods into position. Each pod carries a lamp which is turned on and off using the three-way switch on the panel. Only one side can be used at any one time, so you need to select left or right filament. To the left of the control is a dip lever. Just like a car, this lever dips the lights in their pods. This is necessary as being a tail dragger, the Spitfire sits on its tail wheel, producing an upward angle. Without dipping, the lights shine out and upward and not fully on the ground. By dipping the filaments, the pilot gets better illumination when taxiing. Move to the right side panel. At the top is the voltmeter for battery condition and immediately below that, the generator charging amps meter and switch. Coming down the right side, we have the all-important engine management section of the panel. This consists of a tachometer, boost gauge, fuel and oil pressure gauges, oil and coolant temperature gauges, and at the base, two fuel tank gauges with their indicator buttons. The fuel gauges are off at all times unless the buttons are pushed for a reading. This was to conserve power supply and wear on the delicate instruments. The fuel gauges have double scales to show the fuel level in normal level flight and when on the ground at an angle of rest. Over on the extreme right of the panel is a small switch. This is the magneto starting switch and it delivers power to the engine magnetos for starting. Perhaps the most important element of the instrument panel grouping is the central spring-mounted blind flying panel, so called as it contains all the major instruments a pilot needs to fly the aeroplane without looking outside. Also called the Flying Six, the instruments are airspeed indicator in miles per hour, artificial horizon, climb and descent or vertical speed gauge, altimeter with a Colesman pressure setting dial and knob, the gyro compass direction indicator, and finally the standard RAF type turn and slip indicator. This flying six panel can be found on all wartime RAF aircraft to enable pilots to transition type easily. The layout continues to be used today on many modern aircraft. Along the base of the instrument panel are two compass correction card holders, two rotary switches for the cockpit lights, and the engine start switch behind its safety cover. At the top centre of the instrument panel is the standard RAF reflector gun sight. The illuminated target reticle can be turned off using the switch immediately to the left of the gun sight. 
On the left wall of the cockpit can be found the TR9 radio control unit. To use the communication radios, first turn on the radio using the bottom lever. This will toggle the frequency display panel mounted in the left compass card frame on the base of the instrument panel. You can now tune a desired frequency using the two brown Bakelite knobs of the radio unit. To change between standby and active frequencies, use the top lever. Above the radio unit is one of two cockpit torches. The other is mounted on the opposite side wall. Below the radio unit, you'll find the throttle control quadrant. The large white handled lever is the throttle. The black lever is the propeller pitch control and the lever at the back is the mixture lever. The quadrant carries a throttle friction control and a small switch below the plate of the throttle which activates the landing gear lights in the chassis unit mounted on the panel. To the rear of the quadrant are the trim wheels for elevator and rudder and the pitot heat switch. Between the seat pan and the map case is the coolant radiator door lever. This opens and closes the big door on the rear of the radiator mounted under the starboard wing. Immediately to the rear of the map case is a small click spot to toggle on and off the engine cowlings and service doors of the fuselage. Moving further aft we come to two ring pull levers. These are, in a real Spitfire Mark 1A, flare release levers, but we have another use for them in this simulation. The front one, when pulled, will bring the cockpit to a cold, dark state. That is all switches off, levers zeroed, and all systems and controls at zero. From here you can begin the process of starting your Spitfire manually, just as it would be in the real thing. If you're in a hurry to get going or just don't want to bother with the lengthy start process, pull the second lever. This is a quick start switch which will place everything in the cockpit in a ready to start state, just short of actually starting the engine. Moving to the right of the cockpit, we have the remote contactor. This unit allowed a pilot to transmit a signal indicating his presence and position to the ground for a 15 second period in any minute. This was necessary to avoid giving away his position to the enemy. A switch on the unit will start the counter needle moving and on the dial is a red segment indicating the 15 second time slot for the signal transmission. Tucked away on the sidewall rail beneath is the switch which toggles on and off the external power battery cart. Using this switch will connect the cart to the nose of your aircraft and will power up some of the instruments. It will also allow sufficient power to be used to start the engine without draining the onboard battery. Ahead of the remote contactor is the Morse code lighting and keying unit. There are switches for the top light when signalling someone above and bottom light for signalling below. The keying switch flashes the lights and thereby the Morse signals. The large black unit is the landing gear or chassis control. The lever is gated and the unit has a marker tab which will cycle through up, idle and down. The tab indicates up or down as the gear is travelling and always settles at idle when the gear is locked either up or down. There are two other gear indicators beside the lights units on the panel. These are small red rods which project out of the top surface of each wing when the gear is down. To the right of the pilot seat are the harness release switch, emergency gear lever, windshield de-icing pump and the oxygen control. The emergency landing gear system is basically a bottle of CO2 gas released into the air system feeding the landing gear pistons. It is triggered by using the red lever, but be careful, it's a once only action. You cannot retract the gear once this lever has been used. The control column carries the famous Dunlop patent ring grip and firing button with its safety ring. 
In the centre of the grip is the brake lever. There are no foot brakes in a Spitfire. The brakes are operated by squeezing the cycle-like brake lever. Well, that completes the cockpit guide, so we can now move on to the engine start procedure, taxiing and takeoff. We're going to start the engine from a cold, dark state. First ensure that the park brake is set. The lever should be hard over to the right. Switch on the external power source and check that voltage is reaching the gauge and instruments. Switch on the magneto start switch. Turn on the navigation lights. Turn on the generator switch. Turn on the pito heater switch. Check fuel levels in the tanks and open the valves to both tanks. Turn the fuel pressure cock to carb and check for at least two pounds at the gauge. Turn the cock to engine and unlock the primer. Now pump the primer to get about four pounds at the gauge. Relock the primer. Remember that the Mark 1A has an auto mixture system. The engine controls the mixture, so there are only two positions for the lever, auto rich and auto weak. Set mixture to auto rich. Set propeller to maximum revs fine pitch. Crack the throttle. Turn on both magnetos. Now, if you want to, shout clear prop loudly. Personally, I don't because I get embarrassed in front of the neighbours. Flip down the cover and press the starter. Open the radiator shutter door. Check oil and coolant temperatures are rising. Set the altimeter to field altitude. Now test the magnetos for correct function. Open up to get around 2000 to 2500 RPM. Flip down the left mag and watch the tachometer. If you see a drop in RPM of around 100, the mag is working fine. Turn the left mag back on and do the same for the right. About 100 RPM, no more. Reduce power to idle and complete the warm-up. A note here on temperatures. The Merlin gets hot very quickly and if the temperature reaches over 90, you will risk blowing it up. We have modelled engine failure into the Spitfire, so if you do reach between 90 and 100 degrees, the Merlin will fail. That completes the engine start procedure. Now we're going to taxi out and take off for a short flight and a land back at the field. Before setting off, pull down the fuel drop down menu and ensure that your center of gravity is at least at 35%. Taxiing in a Spitfire requires concentration. The view forward is very poor due to the angle of the aircraft and that long nose ahead of you. So we taxi using a series of short S turns to see out the front quarter screen. Now turning a Spitfire on the ground requires differential braking. Why? Because at slow speeds there is not enough airflow over the surface of the rudder to give you any rudder authority. We don't have a wheel linked to the rudder to steer with either. So to turn a Spitfire at slow ground speed we apply the brakes and use the rudder to distribute pressure to the wheel brakes in disproportionate amount, in a way that favours the wheel on the side of the turn. We have no toe brakes, so squeeze the brake lever and then push the rudder in the direction of the turn you wish to make. You will see the differential pressure on the needles of the brake pressure gauge as you make the turn. It takes practice and at first it is not easy, but if you set up your controls correctly, it should become second nature when steering your Spitfire at slow speeds. For those who would rather not spend too much time practicing
difference in maneuvering on the ground, but rather just get flying, we have provided a way to disable differential braking. Just click on the brake gauge glass once and you'll have full rudder authority from standstill. This is not realistic, but it does make life a lot easier. Before takeoff, ensure the canopy is open and the door is in canopy lock position. Parking brake should be on. Feed in a small amount of nose down trim. Open up to plus three boost and release the brake. As you pick up speed, open up to plus five boost and be ready on the rudder to catch any swing. The simulator will try to push you out, but we have done a lot of work in the code to try to minimize this effect. The Spitfire will swing with torque anyway, so be sure to catch that with gentle rudder input. Once the tail is up, hold her there until you reach 80 to 90 miles per hour, and then gently pull back on the stick to lift off. As soon as possible, raise the gear. Hold the aeroplane level until you have a speed of at least 140 miles per hour before starting your climb. At around 160 to 180 miles per hour, begin a gentle climb. Reduce the power to around plus four boost, lock the door and close the canopy. Whilst you are flying, have a look left at your left wing aileron. Try a gentle left turn and watch the inner end of the aileron. You will see a white and yellow area painted here. This marking indicates aileron float. The white area is the permissible amount of float for the aileron under pressure. The yellow area is a warning that you may be overstressing the aileron. This marking assisted pilots when maneuvering at high speed in aerobatics or combat. By keeping the aileron out of the danger area, they could protect the airframe from overstress. The official pilot's handbook is supplied with this package and contains much useful information on aerobatics and flying limitations of the Spitfire. We earnestly recommend studying it. Centered below the instrument panel and immediately ahead of the control stick is the P11 compass. This compass has a moving heading bezel and a bezel lock. Here we're on a heading of roughly 180 degrees. We will be needing a heading of 300 degrees which is set opposite the lubber line of the compass and locked. When the new heading is required, the pilot simply turns his aeroplane so that the crossbar of the compass needle is centered between the T lines marked on the bezel glass. He will now be on the new heading. As we approach the field, we need to bleed off speed quickly. The Spitfire is a very eager aeroplane and is difficult to slow down. Back off the power early and aim to close on the field at around 180 to 200 miles per hour. As you near the field on your approach, slow to 120 miles per hour. Nearing the threshold, drop the flaps and maintain around 80 miles per hour. Over the threshold, close the throttle and easing back a little on the stick, Aim for a three-point landing at around 68 miles per hour. You can land on the main wheel, but do not apply brakes until the tail wheel is firmly planted. Keep the stick right back in the landing roll to prevent a nose over while braking. Shutting down the Merlin is very simple, but there is one thing to remember. Shut off the fuel valves to both tanks and the engine will start to cut. Before it fully cuts, pull out the slow running cutout. This will leave sufficient fuel in the cylinders for a hot start if you are taking off again any time soon. 
Well, that completes this detailed look at the Spitfire Mark 1A. We hope you have found it helpful in understanding the aeroplane and how to operate it successfully. Good luck with your flying, and above all, have fun.